Welcome to Unit 14. We're going to visit about ionic binary ionic compounds, meaning it's made out of two elements. Uh, you might notice, <coughs> looking at the section list here, that uh, there's quite a few sections involved in this. This is one of your longer PowerPoints, about 20 slides or so. But we'll uh, work through this and kind of see how this thing works. It's actually fairly logical in the end. So what we're going to look at in this one is the criteria we have for the stability of ions. How do we know? Uh, the idea here is we're going to bring elements together. They're going to give up or take on electrons uh, to make new compounds. We have 65 million compounds. we got to get them from somewhere because we only have about 60, 70 elements we actually work with. We're going to look at that. And secondly, we're going to look at the Lewis symbols for the atom. So how do we talk about a Lewis symbol? How do we talk about what we call those valence electrons? Well, how are they important in making compounds? We're going to look at the octet rule. Uh, something that tells us about an, a guiding principle again for making these compounds. Then we're going to learn how to write formulas for and name binary ionic compounds. So the first part we'll look at is the stability of ions, the criteria we have for stability of ions. Now if we go back <coughs> and think about the periodic table, over here, I've slowed down my mouse so maybe you can follow it better. Uh, yeah, I look down in here what I see is in the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, those guys are particularly unreactive, meaning whatever they've got going they like, and they aren't out there trying to shop it around and find something different with which to work. And so there's something something about that stability of those ions that's important. One things we might notice about them is they're in group 18, which means they each have eight valence electrons, with the exception of helium, which only has two electrons altogether. So he has two valence electrons. He has a filled S subshell. So there must be some sort of stability, special stability associated with those eight. We'll think about the eight for right now. And so the driving force we have in electron exchange or electron sharing to form compounds is the quest to have eight valence electrons. Now it's going to be different depending on what we're putting together. Here we're focusing on ionic compounds, ones where we actually transfer electrons back and forth. Here we're really talking about metals. Remember the metals are over here on the left hand side of the chart combining with nonmetals. The next section talks about when nonmetals and nonmetals get together. So what happens here is based on our observations about the noble gases, we realize there must be something special about having eight valence electrons. And so what you might think about then is if you're an element out there and you don't have the eight valence electrons, what your quest in life might be is to get eight valence electrons, which you can do. <coughs> by running into somebody that also has to try to get to eight valence electrons. So for example, if I have to give up an electron to get to eight, then maybe I can find somebody out here who wants to donate electrons so they can go to eight at the end. And so that's sort of the basis of forming these ionic compounds. But the octet rule says, down at the bo bottom here, is atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons. We're focusing in this section, in this unit, on gain and lose. In the next section, we'll focus on sharing electrons until they're surrounded by eight valence electrons. So as you might think, uh, there's going to be some exceptions to that. Notice hydrogen only has two electrons. Uh, it can only take two electrons in there, so hydrogen and helium both can only have at most two valence electrons. We'll find others. We won't dwell on them in this course, but some that can take more than eight electrons uh, under certain circumstances. So we'll see those types of things cropping up. So let's think about the practical aspects of this. What does this mean to you trying to figure out how these things go together? So the ionic compounds are made by the transferring, okay, the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. You're giving up or you're taking on. And so <clears throat> think about forming ionic compounds. Here's our periodic table at the bottom. What you might notice in here is, oh, 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 don't do that. Here is my stair step line, it separates metals over here non-metals over on this side. So what we're really looking at is metals and non-metals combining with each other. That's the focus in this unit. The focus in the next unit will be non-metals with each other. Okay, so let's take a look now and see what happens here. So uh, this is a the slide just to indicate this is what the next unit will look like is what happens if we share and so what we have then is we form what we call molecular or covalent compounds. Covalent's an older term, so you may find me using that once in a while. Molecular is the more current term for these. These are cases where things share, and what happens is these are nonmetals going together, and consider hydrogen to be also like a nonmetal. He's kind of a strange guy on the periodic table. So 
that'll be next unit. So what we're going to look at here is the ionic compounds. So this will be metals and nonmetals. That's what we'll be looking at. So if we look at the abbreviated chart over here, <coughs> I've taken and pared down the periodic table a little bit and put it in the sense of the, the metal line is drawn in here. Coming in like this. Oops, wait a minute. Let's shift it again. Uh, metal line is drawn down here. Okay, so it separates the metals over here from the nonmetals on that side. And these are the groups we're looking at, we're, the elements we're looking at. These guys on this side on the left reacting with those on the right. The gray elements are the metals, the green elements are the nonmetals. And there's certain, these guys along the stair step line themselves can be metalloids. It turns out some things are more metallic than others, some things are less metallic than others, we don't care. Okay, it's not going to change our conversation about these compounds that we make. So let's take a look now at what happens in this formation, octet rule and the formation of these ions. So the octet rule tells me I have to lose, gain, or share electrons to attain eight valence electrons. Now we know the valence electrons are given by the last digit in the group number. So what look at now is let's look at group one. So group one out here, and let's let's stick with lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, frantium. Hydrogen is kind of the same, but hydrogen has <coughs> it's really more of a <coughs> non metally type of thing. But these guys now have <coughs> if you think about their electron configurations, they all end in S1. Lithium ends in 2s1, 3s1, 4s1, 5s1, 6s1, all the way down. If I, if I lose one electron, and I have, no matter what I am, if I lose one electron, I will then have a 1 plus charge. Okay, now the trick is, if I look at lithium, if lithium has a 2s2 electron configuration, he loses an electron, he'll then have the configu electron configuration of noble gas helium. If potassium down here loses one electron, he just backs up in the periodic table one element, and he has the same electron configuration as argon does. So by losing one electron, those elements can get to a plus one state. In that plus one state, they have the same number of electrons as their corresponding noble gas does. Look at group two. The argument's not hard to develop from there. Group two is going to be all ending in S2, 2S2, 3S2, 4S2, 5S2. If they lose two electrons, if calcium loses two electrons, he'll then have the electron configuration of argon. Remember that the calcium does not turn into an argon. Calcium still has 20 protons. That identifies the element. It's just missing two electrons in that process. And so these guys over here will tend to lose uh, valence electrons. The, the metals over here. So these metals down here will tend to lose electrons as well. So metals tend to lose electrons. Now, if you look on the other side of the chart and think about the nonmetals, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all the way down here, these guys up in this area, notice that fluorine, fluorine is only one electron away from having the same number of electrons as neon. Okay, so if fluorine could pick up an electron, he'd have the num same number of electrons as neon. Where in the world would fluorine pick up an electron from? Well, remember these guys over here, the metals? They're looking to get rid of electrons, aren't they? So we can work out a transfer between a metal electron and a nonmetal atom. We can donate the electron from here, from the metal, to something over the nonmetal side and form a new compound, form an ionic compound. Some of these ch changes that I'm talking about here are absolutes. Uh, we know exactly what they're going to look like. These ones I've drawn into this table is group ones will always lose one electron, become plus one cations. Group twos will always lose two electrons, become plus two cations. The halogens will always pick up one and become <coughs> minus one anions, oxygen, sulfur. Nitrogen, phosphorus. Notice I kind of left places blank here along this part because they'll do multiple things. They can take on multiple charges. Uh, the other ones I, I mentioned over here on the side, aluminum is plus three. If you look at a periodic table, uh, right here. Okay, it didn't work. Look at a periodic table. Aluminum is here, number 13. Down here is zinc in a diagonal, and here is silver. So aluminum is plus 3. 
zinc is plus two and silver is plus one. Those are the only ones we get into in that in that uh, transition elements where we're going to have any kind of confidence in them at all. <coughs> and so one of the ways we can streamline this and kind of think about it and hopefully visualize this is we draw something called Lewis symbols named after G.N. Lewis who was a big contributor to bonding theory. And so what we do in that, we take and write the element symbol and then we draw a dot to show us how many valence electrons it has. It doesn't matter where the dot is, none of that matters at all. Typically I've seen them done different ways. You'll spread them all the way around and then pair them up when you have to or you'll pair them up early like in magnesium because they're both in the same shell. None of that matters. The important part is here's my symbol, here's how many valence electrons I've got. Okay, So, um, Notice in group 17, they have seven valence electrons, fluorine, chlorine, bromine. There's missing one. What it helps you do is visualize what they have to do to get to an octet. These guys down here need to pick up an electron to get to an octet, while these guys up here have to give up an electron to get to an octet. Theoretically, they could pick up seven electrons, but that's a lot of work <coughs> compared to dumping one off to somebody else. So let's take then and look at writing a formula for a compound using that kind of an approach. And so Sodium is in group 1, so he has one electron, one valence electron. Chlorine's in group 17 and has seven valence electrons. So I have seven dots around there. When they go together, what happens is the sodium says, here, chlorine, take my electron, because that way the sodium, now with his plus charge, he dropped an electron, has got a noble gas electron configuration, and chlorine, having picked up that electron, <coughs> also has a noble gas electron configuration. So the whole game of ionic compounds is transferring electrons back and forth until everybody thinks in their head they have an electron configuration like a noble gas. Uh, remember again, it doesn't change the element. When I take my sodium, here this is the element sodium. When I take and I dump an electron, this has the same number of electrons as neon does, but uh, argon does, but turns out they aren't the same because sodium has 23 no, it has 11 neutrons. I don't appear to have from 11 neutrons, and neon it is has has 10. So it doesn't change the element. It just changes how many electrons it's got. So these two could combine very nicely in a one-to-one -one ratio: one sodium, one chlorine. Boom, boom, everything's good. But what happens now if we change things a little bit and let's take a barium, who's in group two and takes two valence electrons? Then to make the compound between barium and fluorine, for example, each fluorine can only take on one electron. So even though barium has two to unload, he can only put one of them with that fluorine. Then he needs another fluorine to come in, and he does this with it. Okay, he has to <coughs> transfer another electron to this one. So I end up with two fluorines going together with one barium to make that new compound. Okay, so what you might recognize from here is very. I've used specific elements. <coughs> But basically, any group 1 element with any group 17 element, as in this example here, will always react in a 1 to 1 ratio. And any group 2 element will react with any group 1 element in a 1 to 2 ratio. Okay, So you get those patterns done. The periodic table is very useful for that sort of thing. So then, let's go into here. So let's say we want to write formulas for ionic compounds. You have to jumble those things around, figure out how many of these, how many of those, how many they trade off. And one of the ways you can do that, a very common way that we like to use is something like this, is we have to account for all the electrons. Okay, so every electron given up by the metal has to be accepted by a nonmetal. They, they just don't go off into space. They don't grab them out of space. They don't go off into space. So a fairly easy way of doing this, doing this is called a crossover approach. And what you do is you write out, for example, I want to put strontium and barium bromine together. Then I think about strontium, he's in group two. Now let me go to the table. Strontium is in group two. He's right here, number 39. Bromine is over here in group 17. He's number 35. And so if I take then, that was there, like that. My strontium's in group two, so he takes a plus two charge. Bromine's in group 17, takes a minus 1 charge. What we do is we cross the charges over. We're going to take our 2 from here on the, bro on the strontium, and drag him down to the bromine to be his subscript, and we're going to take the 1 <coughs> bromine here and drag it down by the strontium. My formula becomes strontium bromide, uh, SRBR2. Uh, you notice when you do this that the minus 
one is just a one, you drag that over, and you're just crossing them over to get those subscripts. It tells you the ratios in there. Similarly for the aluminum, he's plus three, oxygen's minus two, you cross those guys over and you get Al2O3, and same thing here, although I see a mistake on this one too. Everything's good in this line except this should be a sulfur here and not an oxygen. I'll fix that after I record this. You won't ever see it. The next group might see it. All right, so it's a fairly simple crossover thing we can do. Now, once we've written these formulas for compounds, we need to name these compounds. So the idea of naming on a compounds is fairly straightforward. The metal keeps whatever its name was. If I brought in, this is barium, that's barium. This is potassium, that's potassium. This is strontium, that's strontium. Aluminum, aluminum, calcium, calcium. They keep their names. That's not hard at all. <coughs> what happens in nonmetal is his name ends in IDE. IDE, 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 all the way across. So my BAO becomes barium oxide, potassium sulfide, strontium chloride, aluminum sulfide, calcium nitride. Notice I do not have to put anything in the name that tells you how many atoms of each kind there are because I know that because I'm an expert and you're an expert or will be an expert at ionic charges. So if somebody walks up and says, hey, I've got some aluminum sulfide, everybody knows what that formula is. Aluminum takes a plus three charge because he's in group 13 and sulfur takes a minus two charge because he's in group 16 and so you cross over the charges, the minus two and the plus three and you end up with that formula. Now you probably knew this was going too smoothly. So I have this periodic table here where everything's cushy and I've got one charge and everything it looks fine, but it turns out that some elements can take different charges depending on what happens. This, this is evident in their physical properties too. If I have a solution of copper one chloride, it's clean, uh, it's green. If I have a solution of copper two chloride, it's blue. They have different colors, different properties in there. So what happens now if you look at these things that have these multiple charges to them? <coughs> so here we go. This is iron and iron 3. Iron with 2 plus charges means he lost 2 electrons. Iron here's lost 3. Copper's lost 1 or 2. Lead's lost 2 or 4. Gold's lost 1 or 3. Different charges exist. And so everything we've done so far is intact. It's going to work. If I want to combine iron 2 ion with uh, a compound, if I want to take and put together if I want to put together iron 2 and combine it with chlorine, well chlorine is over there in group 17 it takes a minus 1 charge, put a minus 1 here and then what I'm going to do then is cross my 2 here and my 1 over there I'll get FeCl2 <coughs> works exactly like it worked before to this point everything's fine it looks great now don't get all stressed say, how do I know which one it is how do I know which one it is because if somebody walks up to you in the street and the world's the best chemist in the world and they have say I have some iron has a charge on it they don't know what the charge is you have to tell them what it is you have to let them know something about it and so I can take and cross those over just like I did the others okay now let's take a look at what happens here. In the naming of the ions, it's going to be a little bit different. So, for example, if I go back, I should have finished that job while I was there. Is Suppose I take the iron as a plus 3, and I combine that with a chloride like that, then I'm going to have a 3 chlorines and 1 iron, so I have FeCl3, looks like that. That's a 3, if you can't read my writing. So, by our process we've been using, we would call this iron chloride, we would call that iron chloride, but they're different compounds. So we have to distinguish between them <coughs> when they have those different charges. And the way we do that is we take and write out iron, and in parentheses in Roman numerals, we put down what the charge is on the iron ion, which is plus 2 in that case, and call them iron 2 chloride. And then down here, I'll take and I'll have iron 3 chloride, the name of that one. Okay, so uh, we have a slightly different nomenclature if it's not one of those. If it is one of those, it takes multiple charges. We have to pay attention to that and say which charge we've got. 
<coughs> examples down here. And be careful with this because you look in here and go, this is lead, this is PbO2, and you call it lead 4 oxide. Where in the world does the 4 come from? Think of it this way. I need to know the charge on the lead to be able to put that 4 in there. Well, I have two oxygens. What we know about oxygen is he's in group 16. It takes a minus 2 charge. 2 times minus 2 is minus 4, which means my, uh, my lead must be a plus 4, and so this is the charge on the lead. This is not how many oxygens I have. This is not, it's, it's not how many leads I have. It's what is the charge going to be on that lead ion. And that's a run through on the nomenclature. You should take a look in the textbook and see more examples of it inside of there. Um, you also need to work on the practice assignment a little bit and you get some more practice that way with it.